Today we're going to talk about solutions, suspensions, and colloids. Solutions, we've talked about them before and in, in earlier in the year, um, but solutions are homogeneous mixtures that are formed when a solute dissolves in a solvent. The solute being the substance that's being dissolved, the solvent being the dissolving medium, the substance that's doing the dissolving. If you have a salt water solution, for instance, the solute is going to be salt and the solvent is going to be water. And solubility is the amount of a substance that will dissolve in a given amount of a particular solvent under certain conditions temperature and, pre and pressure, etc. The units are usually commonly in grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent, and we'll see a, an example of a solubility chart here in just a few minutes. For all solutions, all solutions, the word soluble means it will dissolve, the word insoluble means it will not dissolve. If you are dealing with a liquid-liquid solution only, for instance, alcohol in water, you can say that something is miscible. Miscible is a term used when a liquid is soluble in another liquid. Again, alcohol in water is an example of that. Immiscible would be an example of, of, for instance, oil and water when a liquid is not soluble in another liquid. So alcohol and water for this one for miscible. Oil and water, and if it is not, or if it is immiscible. We have some very general concentration terms. If something is unsaturated, it means that there's less solute dissolved in the solvent than is possible under the existing conditions. So you could get more to dissolve into that solvent. If it's saturated, it is full. It has absolutely all of the solute dissolved in it that it possibly could under those conditions. If you put any more into it, then it's simply going to start forming a precipitate. Um, Supersaturated solution, when more solute is dissolved than should be possible under the existing conditions. Um, and generally, to make a supersaturated solution, we have to have a situation where we more or less tricked it into holding more than it normally would, um, either by heating it up and cooling it down very slowly and in a place where it doesn't get jarred very much or something. But we can make those types of solutions. So what ha would happen if a single seed crystal were added to, for instance, an unsaturated solution? If it's unsaturated solution and we add a single seed crystal, now by seed crystal we just mean a small crystal of the same substance that's already dissolved in there. For instance, if we were talking about a sugar water solution or a salt solution, it would just be a, a, a small crystal of sugar or salt. So if you put that into an unsaturated solution, it's simply going to dissolve, as it says here. If we put it into an unsaturated solution, or excuse me, if we put it into a saturated solution, it will simply sink to the bottom. It will not dissolve. If, on the other hand, we put it into a supersaturated solution, depending on the type of solution, sometimes we'll get crystals of the solute to start precipitating, to start coming out as a solid. This can happen very slowly. You can make rock candy this way, for instance, by putting a piece of string into a or a stick into a supersaturated sugar solution. And over time, it will form these crystals on the string or on the stick. Sometimes it can happen very rapidly, and crystals will just start snow, snowflaking out of the solution or star bursting in the solution. So some of those are, are pretty pretty interesting to see. Factors that affect the rate, how fast something dissolves, heat, heating it up. If we have a hot solution, think of sweet tea, for instance. Um, if we want to put sugar in our tea, having it put into hot tea is going to make the particles move faster, collide more often, and it's going to dissolve faster. If we stir it up, we're simply making those solute particles come in contact with solvent faster, so it's going to dissolve faster again. 
and increasing surface area. We could also refer to it as decreasing the particle size. This would be an example of, for instance, using sugar cubes versus granulated sugar. The granulated sugar is going to dissolve much more quickly because its surface area is larger. The solvent can get to the solute much more easily if the particles are smaller, that surface area is greater. Now, if we're looking at factors that affect how much will dissolve, the degree of solubility. For a solid in a liquid, generally the higher the temperature, then you're going to get an increase in the rate of dissolving for a solid in a liquid. For a gas in a liquid, think about a carbonated beverage. In general, if you have um, a gas in a liquid, again, a carbonated beverage where you have carbon dioxide in the liquid, think about what you could do that would decrease the solubility. In other words, make it go flat. Decreasing the solubility of a gas in, the in a liquid is the same thing as saying your carbonated beverage is going to go flat. You're losing the gas. It's bubbling all of the gas out. So decreased solubility is the same thing as going flat for a carbonated beverage. That's a good thing to remember for a gas in a, li in a liquid. Also, uh, one of the things that you could do is to raise the temperature. If you raise the temperature, um, then you're going to, your Coke's going to go flat more quickly. If you keep it in the refrigerator, it's going to stay carbonated, even if it's open. Another factor for gases is pressure. Pressure, the more the pressure on the system, for instance, keeping the lid on the system, then the more soluble your gas is going to be in the liquid. It's going to stay real fizzy. If you take that lid off and you decrease the pressure, then you're going to decrease the solubility. It's going to go flat. So those are some different things about solutions. A suspension is another type of mixture. Remember we said a solution was a homogeneous mixture. A suspension is a heterogeneous mixture. And the particles, which are relatively large, will settle out upon standing. So if you mix up, for instance, Italian salad dressing, and you let it set for any length of time, it's going to settle out eventually into different layers. If you have muddy water and you just let it get a big container of muddy water and let it sit, then all that silt and stuff, the mud, will sink to the bottom and you'll have relatively clear water on top. Same thing with the precipitate. We've seen precipitates form in several of our labs and it'll be all cloudy in the solution, but even sometimes by the end of the hour, if we let it set for a while, it's going to form that precipitate or that precipitate is going to sink to the bottom. Now, there's a clear distinction between solutions and suspensions. The, the type of mixture in the middle is um, a little bit odd, and they have some cool different types of substances when we deal with colloids. Now, it really does depend on which textbook you're looking at. Some textbooks will tell you it's homogeneous, some will tell you it's heterogeneous. It really kind of depends on what kind of colloids you're looking at. But it is a mixture whose particles are intermediate in size and they will not settle out upon standing. And it's not the same as a solution. If you can't talk about a solute and a solvent, what we usually refer to is the dispersed phase, which is the stuff that's getting mixed into the other material, and the dispersion medium, which is what's, what that that material is being mixed into. So this would kind of correspond to the solute. Again, you cannot call it a solute because it's not a solution, but you're thinking about the substance that's being mixed into the other. And then this would kind of be like the solvent. Um, in the case of a solution, because that's what you're using to mix all of that other material up. Again, don't call it that. Do not call it that. Okay, you're probably going to want to pause this for a couple of minutes and get this information copied down into your table on your notes. Um, 
because um, just like I said, pause it for a few minutes and get that copy down and then start it back up as we discuss it. So when you talk about particle size, particle size is one of the key things that tell you the difference between the three different kinds of mixtures. If the particle size is very small, we're gonna, it's going to be in a, a solution, classified as a solution. If it is medium in size, we're going to we classify it as a colloid. You can't really see the particles, can't see the particles at all when you're down in the nanometer size. But if you get anything larger, it's going to be referred to as a suspension. And I'm not sure why I circled that yet because we're still talking about particle size. It's going to be referred to as a suspension. And generally in suspensions, we can see the, visually see those particles. Um, I'll come back to Tyndall effect in just a moment. But if the effect of gravity, solutions do not settle out, colloids do not settle out, but suspensions do settle out when you stand them. Filtration, you cannot separate solutions or colloids by filtration, but suspensions, you can. Again, as far as uniformity, solutions are clearly homogeneous, suspensions are clearly heterogeneous, and colloids are kind of borderline. So. I wanted to leave a Tyndall effect till now. The only substance that exhibits a Tyndall effect is a colloid. And let's look at why. Okay, here is a picture of what a colloid um, will do when you shine a beam of light through it. This is a true solution right here. And you notice as the beam of light is shown through that the light just passes through. You can't see it at all. If in fact, if this it could go the other side, it doesn't show a mixture here. I wish it did. But if you had, excuse me, a um, suspension here. If this were a suspension, it would not let the light go completely through. A suspension would block the light completely as it entered the solution because the particles are so, so big that it blocks the photons of light. If it's a solution, the particles are so small, the photons of light can go through that solution pretty much unchanged. But look at what happens here in this colloid. If the colloid is fairly, is, you know, transparent or at least translucent, what you're going to see in there is that pathway of light. And that pathway of light is what we call the Tyndall effect. And it happens because the particles in that colloid are medium sized, so they don't block the light, but they also don't let it go through unharmed or unchanged, shall we say. What it does is scatter the light. And when it scatters the light, it makes that pathway of light show up. If you've ever seen one of those shows where they, somebody's trying to steal something and they're trying to get past the security system, and you can see them spray something like hairspray or something into the air and all those laser beams start showing up and you can see them as little red beams of light. That's the Tyndall effect. The stuff they're spraying in the air is a colloid. And that colloid exhibits the Tyndall effect and you can see the pathway of the light when it's being scattered by that colloid. So here are some examples of solutions and colloids. Solutions, notice that there are nine different types of mixtures depending on what, what the solvent or dispersed medium is, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, and what the solute or the dispersed material is. So if we have a solid dissolved in a solid, that's an alloy, if it's dispersed in a solid, it's a colored gem, like a ruby or a sapphire or something like that. A solid, and, and this is weird because when you think of solutions, just the first thing that pops into your head is liquid. And if it's a solution, it has to be a liquid. But notice that a solution can be any state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. A solid dissolved in a liquid is ocean water. A solid dissolved, or excuse me, dispersed in a liquid is jello, jelly, blood. The gels and sols, you can see the terms down here for colloidal mixtures of a solid dispersed in a liquid. Um, solid 
dissolved in a gas is sulfur vapor in air, for instance. Um, smoke would be an example of the colloid of a solid dispersed in a gas would be smoke. A liquid dispersed in a so or dissolved in a solid, mercury and copper. I love colloids. Pearls, opals, those are some examples of um, again, colloidal systems of liquids dispersed in solids. And you can, that milky look is what you get when that happens. Liquid in a liquid, alcohol and water. But for a colloid, it's mayonnaise. Some of our liquid makeup foundations, they're called emulsions. Again, a liquid dispersed in a liquid is an emulsion. Liquids in a gas, if they're dissolved in a gas, is a fog. But if it's dispersed as a colloidal system, it's hairspray, which is why they spray the hairspray if they want to see that Tyndall effect when a laser beam is being is shown. Those are aerosols. Another term, a colloidal mixture of a liquid dispersed in a gas. Um, gas in a solid. Hydrogen adhered to platinum. I had to look a little bit to find some of these examples of solutions. But for a colloid, ivory soap, marshmallows, that's a gas dispersed in a solid. Gas in a liquid, Dr. Pepper, Sprite. Um, but as a colloidal system, when the particles are a little bigger, it's whipped cream. It's the different kinds of foams that we get. Notice there is no such thing as a colloid that is a gas dispersed in a gas. If we have two gases mixed together, they will always form a solution. So um, that's an important fact to remember that there's no such thing as a gas-gas colloidal system, only a gas-gas solution.